Today, I'm excited to be here with Catherine Golub, and she is a career clarity and leadership coach. And we're going to have some a great conversation around how do we, what, what are the steps to getting clear about uh, the next steps in our career? And um, particularly, we'll touch a bit on burnout as well, which is really important to, to focus on. But first of all, I want to say hi, Catherine. Thanks for being here. Hey, George. Thanks for having me. I'm yeah. happy to be here. Yeah, so looking forward to this. So let me go ahead and um, read your official bio for the audience, and then we'll, sure. we'll get going. All right, so Catherine Golub is the founder of the Center for Callings and Courage, and we'll talk about that in this conversation, um, and, a, and a career in uh, clarity and leadership coach with eight years in full-time practice. Uh, Catherine specializes in helping burned out change makers who are confused about their next steps uh, and to help them heal from burnout, get clear about what's calling them next and develop the confidence to make that vision into a reality. She lives in Potomac, <laughs> Potomac land in present day Western Massachusetts next to a community farm uh, with her 13 year old um, child and her partner. Her latest project is Coaching for the Collective which is a coach training for social justice leaders. Um, I love it. And uh, I probably totally mispronounced the, <laughs> the, the land. You want to share? Yeah. Sure. That's Pocumtuck land. Pocumtuck. Yeah. Pocumtuck land. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Okay. So um, I want to start with, you know, in, in, the, in your bio, you, you talk about not just your bio, like your, your focus is, is helping um, change makers, social justice leaders, heal from burnout and kind of get clarity about the next steps and, and manifesting that vision. Uh, burnout is something I think, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think some people watching this um, do think about it, uh, but a lot of people don't adequately think about that. And uh, you have particularly a perspective about burnout that's kind of more intergenerational. Um, do you want to talk about that? What's the kind of make that connection for us? Sure. So there's a lot of reasons why people burn out. And I often, when we burn out, that's for several reasons. Um, when it comes to the intergenerational link, I, uh, a few years ago, started studying a methodology called family or systemic constellations. And as soon as I began studying that, there was a pattern that I just started seeing over and over in my clients and have experienced in my own life. Um, there's many, there's many patterns why we get burned out, like I said, but one of them is a um, pattern called parentification. Um, when a parent cannot be the parent of a child um, or they, they were not parented well, it's like there's a vacuum that's created. So say there's a child here, there's a, the level of the parent and the level of the grandparent. If the parents, if the grandparent died prematurely or was not able to parent well, the child may kind of be sucked into that, into that void or vacuum and take on the role of the parent of the parent. Or if their parent is not able to parent them um, effectively for one reason or another, they may then also take on the role of parenting themselves or their siblings. And a lot of my clients come to me with patterns of overworking, overdoing, overachieving, really wishing that they were bigger than they were. Because they, they are committed to confronting our, uh, our society's biggest problems. And it can be very painful to, it's like, oh, I wish, I wish I could change the world with my own two hands. I wish that I could, you know, be far bigger than I am. Um, and, um, and often by just recognizing that there's this, this pattern in place uh, and naming it, it can be really um, liberating to see that. It's not, this is like a small chunk of what I work with my clients on, but that, yeah, I, I had mentioned that pattern to you and it's, um, you know, a lot of my clients are first, first children in the, you know, in the birth order that can also, you know, be, take on that role of, um, of taking on the, all the burdens with their own hands. So just, just recognizing that can be really liberating for people. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, I want to, I want to thank you for, for sharing that because 
um, just having, yeah, like you said, that awareness and having someone to talk to about this and, and starting to notice, oh, okay, so there is a reason that I, I continue to, to fall into these patterns of overworking and burnout. And, um, and of course, you work with your clients on that, and there's a way to move out of that mindset and, and find, find healthier, healthier ways of relating to the struggles um, that, they're, that, they're, uh, that they're working to resolve in the world and within themselves, too. Um, so one of the things that, um, yeah, so, so maybe one of the, I mean, you know, because you, you help your clients with clarity about uh, career and leadership, et cetera. So what is one of those one, what is one like misconception or something that holds them back from, from clarity have you noticed? So one of the biggest misconceptions is that we get clear and then we make it happen. And like, oh, I need to figure this out on my own and, and then I'll go take action. You're, you, you teach the opposite of that and I teach the opposite of that as well. That clarity is an iterative emergent process and mm -hmm. that we get clear by having conversations and listening to the information that, that comes back and doing experiments and really seeing every single action we take as a learning experiment and an investigation of gathering information. Um, and so a, a huge part of what I help my clients with is to be in that process of taking conscious action. So taking action, but then also being conscious of what we're um, of the steps that we're, that we're taking so that they are as efficient as possible, efficient in a good way of, you know, honoring our energy uh, and um, as efficient as possible and as conscious as possible. So this relates back to, for example, the parentification that one of the re biggest reasons my clients get stuck um, is because of internal um, limiting beliefs or behaviors that are making it challenging to take action. Um, and so if you can get that inner clarity and mm -hmm. unstuck and take action, clarity will emerge. Right, yes, yeah. absolutely. I fully believe that as well. So I'd love for you to walk us through, you have this, um, five-step process, right? That, that, that helping clients go from confused to clear about what's next in their work lives. And um, I know, uh, it's, you know there's a lot to the process and it's much more than we were able to discuss in a short conversation, but I wonder if you have some kind of map or overview, can get a sense of it. Yeah. yeah. So for a long time, I articulated this as four steps and I recently added a fifth. So I'm going to share right. the four steps and then the, the final one that I've added yeah. recently. Nice. So, so um, let's imagine that when we're getting clear, we're standing at a gate. So a gate is a moment of a uh, really big decision, right? Or like of a what do I do now moment. So that can be as simple as what do I do with this hour of time that I have? Or this can be like, what do I do with the rest of my life? Uh, and any time that we're facing a big decision, we can say that we're standing at a gate. And the um, I have actually written the manuscript that I'm in the process of publishing called "When We're S When You're Standing at Life's Gate: How to Get Clear About What's Calling You Next." So when we're standing at a gate, we're facing a big decision. The first and this is, this is iterative, right? This is not necessarily linear, but the first step that I will mention is preparing your lens. So to be able to understand what you need and what the world needs when you're standing at that gate and discern what is wise action, we need to be able to see, see clearly. So we need to be able to let go of, heal the limiting beliefs and behaviors that are making it challenging to see, like, you know, imagine a, a dirty windshield. We need to prepare the lens to be able to see clearly. The next step is uh, getting the inside view 
or um, understanding what you really need. And before and you go on, I, yeah, I go wonder ahead. what's yeah. like one um, action we do to prepare to kind of clean that lens. It's like, is there a common mm, reframing that, that that clients need or give us a little yeah. taste of what that means? Yeah, sure. So the work that I do is really about developing habits or competencies. We start right. the work yes. articulating competency-based outcomes. And that's where true changes. Yeah. It's like developing the right, the right habits. Yeah. Right. And so discerning your next step is all about choice, right? Being able to choose what step am I taking? What step am I not taking? And uh, we could wrap up many, many chapters of you know, more in-depth work basically into a sentence, which is that when you are uncertain or facing a big decision or feeling stuck to take these steps. So first we need to pause. Sometimes it's a much longer pause. Sometimes it's a much shorter pause, but we need, we need to pause so that we're not in reactivity, right? So that we can, the pause is the space in which we can choose. So first we pause. And then to uh, embody a compassionate witness so that we're able to witness what is going on within us um, from a compassionate, open-minded place. Then we check in with what, how are we feeling in our bodies? Because it's through the body that our needs communicate and that intuition communicates. All of the information that we can have access to within ourselves is through our body. So pause, body the compassionate witness, notice what you're feeling, notice what you're then thinking, and there's many practices for reframing. Yeah, like no, mentioned. this is super helpful. Like that, that makes that makes it very clear what you mean by clearing the lens, because now we can, yeah. we can, we're not making um, decisions out of choices out of anxiety or reactivity. Right, so, yeah. right. So noticing the stories we that you're telling yourself, if you're like, oh, that story doesn't serve you, what is actually happening, and what story might serve you more, mm -hmm. and then yes. asking, what do you need? Right. What do you need in this moment? And if you keep coming back to pausing, witnessing, what do you feel? What are you thinking? What do you need? That will inform mm -hmm. every next step that you take. Um, yeah, beautifully described. Yeah. So that's the first one is clearing that's the lens. That's the first, yeah. yeah. And then it's understanding, like imagining the life that you long for. Mm. Um, I name this in different ways because different ways land for different people, but imagining the life you long for, which means getting the inside view, which means understanding what you need and want. So there's, I see it as, um, there's many ingredients that could um, build a recipe and many possible recipes for a work life that is um, aligned with what you really long for. So um, in that next step, you know, really taking stock of what you, what you want and need. Um, and imagining lives that would potentially meet those needs. Um, the third is gathering clarity or getting the outside view. So that's understanding what the world needs and wants. And so often it's another, I don't know, misconception, but it's a place that people get stuck that so often um, self work is very inward focused and is not listening to mm. what the world needs and wants and is willing to pay for and really is longing for. So that next step is about taking action and through taking action, gathering information, building relationships. And that's how we get to clear. And the, the fourth is crossing the threshold. So that's, you know, being with what it, what do I, what am I, what is calling me? What is, what it, do I truly long to do? What's the voice of doubt saying? And, um, and tending to the doubts within ourselves and and having the courage to take the next step. So the fifth, the fifth step that I recently just articulated that's really necessary is creating a container. So whether that is um, an externally held container of a coaching, you know, coaching support or an accountability buddy, or I know you use Focusmate. I imagine it may serve as a container yes, like that. Yes. Um, or it's really being very mindful about how we're. Um, 
setting aside time to to reflect to do the, that right. introspection to take that action then we yeah. must have some type of container to hold this process i, I love um, i love that and when you mentioned focus me I, I i'm not sure i'd call that a container it's more just an accountability of showing up to do whatever i'm doing in this hour but i like this idea of um like the contain like like you're you're saying this is a journey and are you looking at it as such rather than just random choices yeah. <laughs> right like th there's a there's a cohesiveness to a direction um yeah something like that like like riverbanks <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right yeah. that's right nice that's really good I, I i love this um five step uh process framework journey that you you bring your clients through and i can see how helpful it is to have um someone like you guide them throughout these throughout these five steps so um tell us tell, tell us about some of the when you say change maker and you know, social justice leaders, like give us some examples. It could, it could be, of course, you want to keep your clients um, confidential, but uh, what might they be doing in their career? Um, maybe, maybe you know, you could even tell us like someone might be working in this kind of environment right now or this kind of role, and then they'd love to 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 move into this kind of role. Like, what's that ideal transition? You I mean, give us one mm -hmm. example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So clients might come to me, they're often in a leadership role in a, in a nonprofit, often around social justice of some sort. So I'm thinking um, racial justice, uh, um, queer and trans rights, um, domestic violence. Um, uh, they're thinking of people who are already in consulting roles, um, people who environmental justice, educational advocacy, um, and they are often, they're usually asking the same, they see three potential paths. So the paths would be, do I chart my own course? Do I start a consultancy of my own or become a, a, a you know independent thought leader of some sort? Or do I take on another position in another organization, um, whether doing precisely the same work or something different? Or do I, am I able to heal from burnout and fall back in love with the work that I do and shift the dynamics of my current role so that I can stay where I am, but really enjoy myself and do it in a nourished way? And they don't know which of those paths is best for them. And and through our work together, they they figure that out and they get clear about that and um, and may take any of those three paths forward. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you for, for sharing that those examples because that's that's very helpful to like mm, maybe I know somebody you know that that could use this um, work especially. Um, one of the you know your your organization is called Center for Callings and Courage. So the word calling uh, is. Uh, you know, a significant idea. And I like that word as, uh, a lot as well. Um, but it, it hasn't been used as much, I think, in, in recent decade, let's say. But um, you have something, you, you, you say it's the refusal of the call, right? Like some people, um, they may have some doubt or a lack of trusting the, the, themselves or trusting the process. So kind of talk about that. What is, what is the refusal of the call and how do we, you know, maybe a few words about how do we get over that self-doubt to, to move forward? Sure. Yeah, so I, I define a call as a longing to take on a new challenge, um, one which is typically usually greater than yourself. And I don't follow Joseph Campbell's map to a T really at all, but there is one piece of the map that I find can it particularly helpful, which is that he articulated that when the hero gets the call, first they receive the call, and then immediately after that, there's a phase called, called the refusal of the call, in which the, the hero uh, turns away from the gate. It's like, I, that's really scary. I don't want to go there. What? Yeah, I don't want to go there. And so Sometimes that refusal of the call is a really important place because we're not yet ready to cross through the gate. We need to do really significant preparation, sometimes for a day, sometimes for many years. 
Um, but other times we're in the refusal of call and we really are ready, but there's a part of us ourselves called the voice of doubt, which is the part of ourselves that says, yeah, but, or what if, what if this happens? What if that happens? And so often people either barrel through the voice of doubt and just charge through the gate. Like, I'm not gonna, I shouldn't be afraid. I shouldn't, or they don't really listen to it, but they also just get stuck in the refusal of the call. They just like, it's, it's too much. I can't deal with it and stays stuck there. And what I find is that um, when we recognize, oh, huh, I'm at the refusal of the call and the voice of doubt is active, when they can, when we turn and face or sit down beside the voice of doubt and listen to what it's saying it needs, stuckness, stuckness is an unmet need. Stuckness is a demonstration of an unmet need. And so when we can sit down next to the part of ourselves that's scared or stuck and say, hey, I'm not running away from you. I'm also not becoming you. I'm just sitting beside you and hearing what you need. So often people move so much. It, it's My work is such an honor because I get to see people tend to their needs and move forward on their journeys. Um, Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So you're, um, I want to talk about your latest project. It's uh, Coaching for the Collective, which is a, a coach training for social justice leaders. Um, tell us anything you like about it. Yeah, sure. So um, I've, this is, this is in the embryonic stage. I'm planning to uh, launch it at next spring. And so I'm really in a process of speaking with former clients, current clients, friends, people who are, you know, who are social justice leaders, who I believe would really benefit from this. So it's, it's still, I'm in the emergent stage with this and getting clear by having conversations and taking, experimenting with You're following it. your own steps. I am. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> um, but I see that so often, there's many reasons why social justice movements are not as effective as we long for them to be. And one of the main reasons is that we, we, we don't know how to hold space for ourselves and each other. We are, the work, there's a lot of grief, there's a lot of rage, the work is really hard, the, the stakes are daunting. And without having the internal capacity to face the challenges that we face and become the people we need to become to rise to the calls of the moment, we, we get stuck as movements and we, there's, there's infighting, there's internal strife, and we doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be that way. And coaching is, I'm not necessarily training um, social justice leaders to become independent coaches outside of what they're already doing, although they may choose to do that. That's kind of a bonus if they choose that path um, or the certification would be a bonus. Really what I want to do is train social justice leaders to be effective leaders and to have the skills of coaching so that they can hold space for themselves, their comrades, their community members, their colleagues, and, um, and be as effective as they can possibly be. Yeah. That's, um, that's awesome. I think it's, yeah, because the cause is one thing, but then it's kind of like the ends and the means. It's like how we get there, <laughs> which is really the relationships we have every day um, and how we move those relationships forward, which moves policy forward, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, yeah, it's, it comes down to uh, how we're able to move others and ourselves and to do it in a positive way that's just, you know, not not burn out, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this is great, thank you. And so if someone is interested in working with you, um, I understand you have a discovery session. Do you wanna talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so if someone's interested in working with me, my website is callingsencouraged.com and they can set up a discovery session there. So it's a one hour really in-depth assessment of what they're struggling with and what they're wanting. Um, and really getting a clear sense if they're a good match for what I offer or if I would recommend something else. So I ask a whole bunch of questions and get clear about really which path I would um, 
advocate for. Sometimes that's an invitation to work with me and sometimes that's something else. So um, that every person that I initially work with goes through that process. Uh, yeah, and it's a free yeah. session. It's free. It's a it's one hour. Free one hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very generous. And uh, I'm, I'm sure helpful because you bring the years of experience to help them kind of quickly diagnose based on that conversation, hmm, it seems like maybe this is the right path or that's the right path, or that's a good path to take the next action for clarity, et cetera. So thank you for that. And you also are um, uh, active on social media, uh, particularly Instagram. I will, of course, put the um, link in the notes of the video. You also have a newsletter, an email newsletter, and uh, you, you have a free uh, online week-long week course called The Orientation Practice seven steps to clarity. So anyway, that's all going to be in the link. It's on your website. So um, anything else you want to say, maybe like final encouragement to your, uh, yeah, the people that you love working with. Mm -hmm. I think the final thing, and this isn't this, the final thing is that on no journey does a hero heroine whatever gender they take, um, go it alone. That after the refusal of the call, then the, then the next step that Joseph Campbell named was, he called that supernatural aid. Doesn't need to be supernatural. We just need, we need each other. Um, and whoever that is, even if it's your dog buddy, I don't know, but like we need, we need um, connection, we need support, we need allies. And so whatever shape that manifests, if that's going for a walk in nature, if that is, if that is finding a coach, if that mm -hmm. is, um, whatever, whatever that is, is that we need, we need support and no one is supposed to go this journey alone. So I, I would say the process of coaching can, can feel supernatural, <laughs> it can be life-changing. So. Thank you so much, Catherine, for the work you do and how you do it. Thank you so much. Thank you.